Yuma, welcome to Floriad Reimagined. I'm Dan Borsch and this is Let's Talk. It's so great to have you here as a part of this discussion as we all adapt and grow to our new normal. And to begin with, as part of this celebration of biodiversity of spring of discussion, I pay my respects to the traditional custodians, the Ngunnawal people, whose management and maintenance of land and culture is something that we still share in today. And so crucial as we're having these very important discussions about where we are right now and where we're going to into the future. In these unusual times, as we still grapple with the consequences of COVID-19, we're taking very special precautions here at Floriard, making sure that everyone is physically distanced, but socially together, that hand sanitizer is widely available and that uh, groups are much smaller. So it's a much more intimate experience. And for wherever you're watching this, I'm hoping uh, that you're feeling that as well. Today, we've got a really fascinating conversation. The ethical omnivore. I wonder when you think of that term, what that says to you. It's a practical guide, 60 nose to tail recipes for sustainable meat eating. And we've got out the guests here, Laura Dalrymple and Grant Hilliard, talking about their book, what they do, how they came to it, and perhaps the most crucial question, the why. As we talk about sustainability, this book is packed with uh, really practical, hands-on representations of that and how that comes to be. This will also be available on the Floriard Australia website where there's going to be plenty more information where you can find out about all the other events as well. I also want to acknowledge our sponsors. Events like this don't happen without lots of support. Uh, the ACT Government, the National Capital Authority, the Canberra Centre, National Circuit as well. Many thanks to all of them and for their ongoing support of Floriard, reimagined this year as we all reimagine the world that we live in and the world around us. I want to get started with our guest today, Laura Grant. Welcome. Thanks so much, Dan. Now, this book is really a representation of the work that you do, your life's work around the feather and bone providors in Sydney. To start with, I want to find out about you. Why the ethical omnivore? <laughs> why did we write the book or why did we call it The Ethical Omnivore? Well, I'm interested in what <laughs> underpins the, the whole thing. Let's start with why you wrote the book. Um, well, I'll start. Mm. We do a bit of a double act, as you can probably imagine, because we're life and business partners. So pardon us if we interrupt each other and, and tag team. Um, we wanted to write the book because over the last 10 years at least, we found that we're answering the same questions in our butchery day in and day out. Um, and they're questions such as, where does my meat come from? What breed is it? Um, how old was it when it died? Where does it come from? Um, uh, how did how it did die? It die? Mm. And should I be eating meat at all? And if so, how do I eat it? And um, we ourselves grappled with coming with with understanding the provenance of our food when we first started this, and we encountered a lot of what we considered to be obfuscation in the um, labelling and description of foods and the opaque nature of provenance. It was not transparent. It was very difficult to find out where your food came from. And um, so we ourselves grappled with that and have done over the last 10 years. So. I suppose we wanted to put down in a book our answers to those questions in a bid to try to help people, wherever they are, navigate this incredibly complicated and tricky landscape of food in which meat is probably the most complicated and the most challenging and controversial ingredient. Mm. So that's mm. really the reason. And I suppose there's one other thing that's worth saying, and Grant, I'm sure, will echo this, and that is that we felt that, you know, these are, these are difficult times and people are... Um, are concerned about meat and confused and um, what we need now are positive and inspiring stories mm. which help people to feel that there is hope and optimism and that there are ways to that there are people who are doing extraordinary things to repair and regenerate the landscape and to interact in a humane, humane and fair way with um, animal consumption and we wanted to tell those stories so that mm. people have a sense of what's possible. Yeah. I suppose we're talking to about 90% of the audience too because That's right. 
most of us are omnivores. There's a few people that only eat meat and there's a few people that are completely meat free, but for maybe 90% of the population eats some amount of meat at some time. And it might just be fish and it might just be white meat and chickens rather than, than red meat. All of, everybody needs to come to some sort of position with reconciliation mm. with what they eat and how, and how it was grown. So we unashamedly come from a position where we're, we're selling meat and poultry, but uh, hopefully the questions that we're sort of trying to pose will be useful for pretty much anybody who eats. And that really, everybody has to come to the table. And so it becomes a sort of a universal discussion. You touched on that point there about people wanting to know where the meat has come from, uh, why or mm. what the process has been. That's, it strikes me that there's been a reinvigoration of, of that interest, those discussions over the last decade or so. Yeah. I, I wonder what are your observations? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think when we started, there was, uh, th there was no real discussion around, say, lamb, where, what breed of lamb it was, where it came from. And you know the the discussions around uh, wine it was you know very clear that people wanted to know where wine was, what mm -hmm. variety it was. Uh, we tried to extend that to to meat and sort of take the same sort of ideas about that it could it could carry attributes of its place and and breed and and that it was important to actually know that that specificity was was really vital and also that you don't have to sort of claim that it's delicious or brilliant quality meat what it is is meat that imbu it, it contains qualities and they are you know it was this age it was grown in this manner it, it it was raised by this person in this place and you can decide for yourself whether you think that's delicious or not so it wasn't really a discussion around taste and taste sort of comes as a result of all the decisions that go before it so what we're trying to highlight were the decisions that went before it and apply that to meat which it really wasn't applied to before that mm. Laura, you said one of the questions people ask you is, is it sustainable mm. to eat meat? That very much underpins this book. What do you say now when you're asked that question? Um, well, I think Grant's right. You know, people, I suppose, I suppose the answer to that question really is, um, it's, I would say it's not really a question of is it sustainable to eat meat or not. Mm. The question is, of the food that one chooses to eat, anybody, um, we all have an obligation and a much greater responsibility now than ever before to um, empower ourselves with the understanding of how that food was produced and, the, and consequently the impact that the production process has on human communities, plant communities, animal communities and you know, soil communities. Um, whether you eat a potato or a pork chop in some ways um, is, is not immaterial, but the point is how is that food produced and what is the impact of that food? Because there are some profoundly unsustainable, you know, cropping regimes and practices, for example, um, that, uh, that cause as much and more damage than some of the, you know, unacceptable animal husbandry practices that people often point the finger at. So I think it's, um, you know, of course it's important to ask the question about meat because when people eat meat, you know, we're complicit in taking a life. It's a very, very big decision. Um, so we don't resile from that and we think that's terribly important. But it's not the only question here. Mm. This, is, this applies to everything, mm. you know. We need to understand that. Yeah, I think probably the other thing to say is that in the back of the book, there's a, a list of sort of guiding principles about how we started. And um, so, we've, you know, we were, we were very sort of clear that uh, all the, the ruminants, at least cattle, sheep and goats, would be grass fed wherever possible. Uh, we wouldn't be buying anything from a, a feedlot because we don't think that is a particularly sustainable way to raise animals. Um, and that every, every animal would live as much as possible outside. And, uh, and we'd buy the whole animal, which is a really distinct difference yes, between what we do and, and what a lot of butchers do. So once you agree to that, it means that you can buy directly from the farmer and it, mm. we, we can bypass the wholesalers to a large extent. Mm. We still have to go through uh, the abattoir system, but that's not, not all the time because now increasingly some of our producers have small on-farm abattoirs, so they handle that side of it themselves. So in a way, it is a much more direct relationship. And by, by establishing that direct relationship and only buying from the producer, 
you bring the you bring the consumer closer to the producer as well. And uh, there's a line from Jonathan Safran Foer, and some of you might know that American writer who who wrote a book called Eating Animals, and he wanted to talk. He talked about opening up the line of sight, and we're very you know we agree with that completely. Opening up the line of sight from where you you stand as a consumer to the person who produced that food. And back again. Is, is it, that's a, about transparency and, it ab- is and about yeah. having that oversight. Yeah. And it is a loop. It, yeah. it feeds back to the producer as well. So one of our main contentions in the book is that every time you buy food and every time you choose to eat something, you're reinforcing the production system that gave rise to it. So, you know, we are, we are powerful actually in this situation, despite the fact that we feel quite powerless. Um, we're only powerless be in, to the extent that uh, we allow ourselves to think that. It, it's it's quite, quite deliberately the labelling of food mm. doesn't make it clear. Mm. Quite deliberately we're asked or we're not given the information that really we need to to make, to make an informed decision. Or the legislation allows it to be, to be that. So the free range egg, th- egg uh, legislation that was passed a couple of years ago most people wouldn't understand that that means that those chickens can be housed in permanent shelters and have access to outside. Uh, whether they choose to go outside is another matter. And so, you know, 10,000 birds per hectare is an extremely high stocking density, and that's what passed for free-range egg production. We would argue that that's, you know, way, way too high. Um, and that what most people imagine as free-range eggs, and this, this is just a, an example, mm. obviously, um, you know, would be birds that are free to move around in free a movable shelter. Yeah. <laughs> You're free to range inside a shed? I don't know about that. <laughs> so so when, it, when it comes to that example, yeah. would you choose not to buy chickens or eggs from the place that has the 10,000 per hectare? Yeah, absolutely. And we don't. Yeah. For, for, so that, for so a that's couple of reasons. Like a, really. That's part of the principles, yeah. you see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that the key there that, that, that got missed and quite deliberately so by the, by the industry, in, industrial egg producers, was that um, you've got an, an asset, chicken, chicken poo is very strong stuff and used sparingly, it's in extremely good as a fertilizer. But in one place for any more than a few days, it is, it is far too powerful. And what was an asset turns into a liability. So any fixed shed arrangement is going to produce a wasteland of ammonia around that shed. And, uh, and the the nutrient from the chicken poo won't be able to be absorbed by the land. It will run off and finish up in the stream. So, you know, this is where it all connects up. So, you know, you, we despair about what's happened to the Murray-Darling Basin and what's happened to the river system there. The excess nutrient in that is largely agriculturally derived. And it's because of, you know, poor use of fertilizer and poor, poor land management practice that produces that amount of nutrient in the water. Uh, and I think it was, you know, for people to see all those fish dying uh, in Menindi was a very sobering sort of moment and it really highlighted how poorly we've managed our natural assets and agricultural production is just part of that. And so people are coming to realise, I think, through the drought last year or the culmination of the drought's effects last year and then the fires, that and these the things are connected. The mm. way we produce our food, the environmental costs of producing our food, our water management, how much carbon we store, fertility generally, are all connected. And then it all finishes up with human health. So, I mean, we've come a long way from just the egg, but it starts with <laughs> an egg. And what comes so first? just the chicken or the egg. Then. Exactly right. And uh, we would say that it's, they're intertwined and you can't yeah. pull them apart. You actually have to look at them as a whole and that's sort of a failure of... That's a failure of the way we understand food production. I think there's another, um, yes, and to support that, I think, um, you know, if people read the book, they will see, as I said before in the book, that there are um, quite a few stories Mm. of um, profiles of the farmers Mm. we deal with. And the farmers we deal with practice what's called regenerative farming. And that's exactly that. It's the idea that you are presiding over an ecosystem and within that ecosystem are a whole series of different, you know, um, uh, life forms and all have to function in a harmonious relationship with each other. And that's what creates the kind of vitality and resilience and capacity that produces in the end a great lamb product, for example, or a great chicken or a great, Mm. you know, a great, you know, cow. 
Um, and unless you understand your landscape as a series of interrelationships between all these different levels of life and, and, and try to allow it to, mani- it to be managed that way, Char- uh, Charlie Massey says, you know, you get out of the way of nature and nature's superior capacity to self-organise determines that balance. Um, you know, so the farmers we work with really don't necessarily think that they are sheep farmers. They see themselves as, you know, soil farmers or, you know, ecosystem farmers, if you like. And that's that approach, that mm. idea that we need to be holistic in the way we solve problems. Because if we think of ourselves as, you know, um, sheep farmers and um, and we think of energy and water and soil and all of these issues, human health as separate, sort of isolated, siloed um, issues that we need to resolve. We won't, we won't solve the problems that we face. And what <laughs> struck me in the book is the sense of community mm. uh, amongst uh, the farmers, be they the mm. eco-farmers or, mm. or otherwise that you mentioned. Uh, how much of that un- has underpinned, uh, I guess, the work that you do, the, the way that you've told the stories, the, the principles of, of how you go about doing it? Mm. It's sort of a late realisation, I think. I think the book for us, writing the book, forced us to recognize a truth that we hadn't quite understood and until then which was that in encouraging and working with farmers who develop their own communities microbial communities uh, and plant communities we also have a community of the people that buy from us and Mm. and read our newsletters who might necessarily buy from us but engage in conversations with us and that that community is is just as viable. The, so the social community really mirrors very closely what's going on under the ground as well. Yeah, that's right. And yeah. it's it's not an accident that you know farmers industrial industrial farmers have one of the highest rates of of mental illness mm. of any of any working group in, in in Australia, and that's because they are so disconnected, mm. and their practice not only disconnects uh, the microbial communities under the ground, it disconnects them. Mm. And when you have a, an emptying out of those rural landscapes, you provide, that disconnection is what, is what you know, sinks us essentially. So we're trying to provide a community mm. and it was a realisation that we actually do have a community and we could draw on that community. And the recipes are directly drawn from the people who buy from us. It's a, it's a, sorry, it's a beautiful thing. And, and this is, it was... Um, uh, it was lovely to suddenly realise that we have customers, you know, we, we met them, they had a child, mm. we got to know their kid, their kid, kids come and they all play together outside the butchery and then they'd have another kid and we suddenly saw that we were, you know, at the heart of a community that we had created and that was really amazing to experience that. Um, it was powerful. That's... And you think about all those rural communities, as Grant says, you know, all the young people leaving because there are no jobs and, you know, the hollowing out of rural Australia, it's a really, really big issue. Mm. And, um, you know, we, um, we will be collectively impoverished unless we find ways to reconnect with each other more effectively. And I think this year, if anything, yes. has taught us yeah. that Absolutely. very point about yeah. That's right. the crucial importance of being connected, yeah. even if we're apart. Yes. Um, and I love that point, and that really shines through in so many of the stories. One that jumped out at me was uh, Rob Lennon, who said, I'm a microbe farmer. I don't grow beef, I grow soil. You've touched yeah. on both of you on microbes. Uh, what does that mean to be a microbe farmer? Well, so it's, it's, it's how you produce fertility. Mm. So the, the rapid decomposition is how, is how you get the fertility to grow anything. Uh, he, while the saleable uh, product from his farm is beef, he understands that's a very small part of the biomass that he's caring for. Uh, that's the end point it's, rather than the it. starting point. Completely. Exactly right. Yeah. And yeah. Exactly right. And so if he knows that if he looks after fertility, and that's, fertility can be understood you know, very directly as carbon as well. This is, this is rotting uh, plant matter and animal matter and insect matter that's returning to the earth. Um, some of it is being eaten. Some of it's in, in really powerful symbiotic relationships as well. Intervening with those and breaking those. And again, it, we're going to just keep saying the same thing. <laughs> it's about connection, you know. So those symbiotic relationships are obviously highly connected relationships, as are the things that, you know, one thing consumes another and produces a waste product. It's only understood as waste if you, if you don't really think of it as a productive whole. 
Um, so his carbon levels on his farm over 20 years have ris risen from, say, an average of 3% to somewhere around 6 to 7%, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you understand that carbon is the great sponge of the earth and that allows him to store five times as much water in the mm. landscape than he was able to do before, then you understand that it's a whole, a whole engine of production mm. that you're actually caring for. Air and light and water are still the, the major things that allow the production of fertility. Most soil is highly compacted. It's lost all its mm. air and porosity. Uh, and that's what allows water, when it does rain, if it rains, to actually sink in and be held in the soil. If you've got highly compact soil, what happens is it hits the top, runs, runs off, off, and to the casual observer, you drive past and you say, oh, their dams are nice and full. That's actually often a sign that they've got highly compacted soils because the first thing that does is it runs off. What you want is the soils to be absolutely saturated and finally the dam should fill. And instead what happens is that it runs straight off, finishes up in the creeks and rivers and takes all that topsoil with it out to sea. Um, when, um, yeah. you know, the, the, um, the uh, reports um, and stories of the condition of the land when white settlers arrived here mm. are really telling because mm. a really common description, adjective that's used to describe the landscape is spongy. Yeah. They would walk on it or they would ride on it and it was literally spongy. Bruce Pascoe talks about it in Dark Emu as mm. well. He, he spends a lot of time on he that does. very point. That's right. And it's a really telling thing because, I mean, you know, all of us can, you don't have to, you only have to go half an hour out of Canberra and there will be some soil that is very different definitely not spongy and um and it's literally it's such a great metaphor because it it's it illustrates graphically that idea of retaining and collecting and harboring mm. and water's life you know if you don't have life if you don't have water then you don't have plants if you don't have plants you don't have you know microbial life so it's uh you know these are not complex principles um they are just ones that we we were talking before um, before we, we came to sit here about the interventionist um, culture that's built up around food production, this idea that there is a technical solution for every problem. You just, you know, you just um, implement a solution onto the issue and then mm. it fixes itself. And in fact, I think we don't want to um, uh, decry the opportunity to use technology to further um, you know production and improve our, our ability to be more efficient and so on but mm. it's not the solution you know it's just a tool mm. um, so uh, this yeah. extractionist sort of idea um, it's a it's a it's a cycle of diminishing returns this idea that farming works by just putting stuff in you know external well, stuff rather than creating it lies the balance doesn't it that, it does. that technology is really important if you understand what, yes. you, what you're using it for. You, you touched on Massey before saying, you know, get out of the way and the environment will take mm. care of it. Mm. The book also has a big focus on um, using the whole animal. That's not a new concept either. That's, no. an, that's an ancient concept. <laughs> yep. And t you touched on Bruce Pascoe. He writes about yeah. that, that the pelt would be used uh, for keeping warm yes. uh, or to start as kindling for fires and every aspect was used. Mm. Uh, how much now are we reviewing or reimagining what has happened here for thousands of years? Yeah, I think it's about simplifying. It can be understood that we're trying to drive towards more complex systems rather than simplified systems. And mm. why, and why is that? Why do well, we get more I complex? Because it's the complexity which gives you fertility and interdependence and resilience. And, Diversity. Yeah. And I think that's what Bruce Pascoe was pointing to is that here is, here is a sort of a, 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 an expertly managed complex system, mm. not a simplified system, that has balance in it and that it's the, and again, getting out of the way of that, of that balance, it, it does have that regenerative ability and self-organising capacity. Mm. But industrial agriculture essentially says that you need a totally simplified ecology to produce the one thing that you're going to sell. Monoculture. And, and that, there is a cost to that because nature will not, tolerate a vacuum and will constantly seek to fill it. So, uh, you know, you will get, by, by producing an imbalanced situation, which is a, which is a monoculture, you, you know, you will always get, that'll generate its own problems. And, and one intervention requires another one, which requires another one. And it's a very, you know, for, I think it's a very disempowering way to farm in a way, because, you know, you're required to come up with, with the solution 
We so imperfectly understand these systems. I mean, you were saying that it's quite a, a simple idea. Yes, it is. The actual complexity of knowing exactly what those exchanges are is, in, is in, in, you know, incredibly complex. And we're only just starting to understand yeah, just right. you know, how fungal net networks I interact mm. with microbial networks to create you know, in, a, in a really sort of amazing dance they of communicate mineral with each other. exchange. They actually send messages. You know, it's and they're able to communicate across vast distances mm. to mm. trees and plants. So... You know, it really surprises me that we are not more humble in the face of knowing how little we know. And it doesn't matter how many times we have to be told how little we know, <laughs> we still say, oh, no, 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 we know what we're going to do now. We're going to, you know, we're going to do this. And um, it's so much of it is getting out of the way and being allowing uh, an interval. So, mm. you know, it, it, interval organises everything. It's how you sort of organise, you know, the movement of animals across a landscape is no different to the way music's organised and you get, you get logic and sense as a result of that same sort of arrangement of intervals. Unfortunately, conventional farming as, as, uh, and backed up by the supermarkets suggests to you that it is okay to have constant abundance and mm. that there is no cost for that, that you can have something that you want all the time. Well, I'm afraid you can't, you know, and if you do want it all the time, there's going to be a really significant cost to providing it. Um, Every society has a period of time where it doesn't do something. That's what fasting is. And too, you know, yeah. and and mm. it provides a, it provides meaning. If you're if you're feasting every day, there's not much, you know, there's, there's not much sense of the feast coming when you haven't gone without. And I think there is no there's no sort of uh, productive system that doesn't need rest. Um, I think what the fires did last year was show that the illusion of abundance is just that that it only takes one fire to block the Prince's Highway and thousands of uh, people, <laughs> sort of holiday makers on the South Coast are going to starve. And uh, it was sort of quite a, quite a sort of an unnerving moment because it's, you know, we don't want to feel like we're living in a world that is quite so uh, vulnerable. potentially vulnerable. That's right. We want to, we want to feel comfortable fragility. that you mm. can open that fridge mm. and it's full every time or you can go to your shop and it's, and it's stacked. And COVID did it again, you know, with with mass buying, all of a sudden the shelves were empty and, you know. I think the whole animal thing is important too. You just Sorry, referred to it before. pushed away from that. <laughs> um, because, um, you know, we talked before about the fact that when you, when you kill an animal for food, it, you're taking a life and mm. it's important to acknowledge and respect that. And part of that obviously is making sure you don't waste anything and you eat the whole animal. And part of what Grant is talking about, I think, is this idea and the monocultural response mm. is that you end up with a system where chicken is incredibly cheap and you can have chicken breast every day of the week if you want. Um, so we're used to eating certain parts of animals which are, which are abundant and we pay a subsidised, artificially cheap price for it. Um, it's of compromised nutritional quality um, and we've lost the capacity to cook the whole animal. We've lost the capacity to understand how to, how to, how to actually consume the mm. whole animal um, and how to only have certain parts of the animal at certain times because they only comprise a tiny percentage of the animal. And if you're eating the whole animal, well, you can only eat it once, you know, because that's all there is, you know. So we really encourage people to engage with eating meat in a very considered and respectful way, I suppose, um, and embrace some of that lost knowledge around how to eat different cuts, how to eat offal, for example. Mm. So well, that's and, part of it, you know. When you also touch on that, uh, sticking with chicken uh, later mm. in the book, uh, a recipe that is about pumping nutrients into your body, particularly during winter, about using the whole body, the feet uh, over, I think it's 36 or maybe even 48 hours. Beautiful, long, broth. slow yeah. broth. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And I read that one and it struck me. So I've got an auntie who's a naturopath. And there you go. at winter, yeah. she sends out a recipe to all the family that is Beautiful. very, very similar to that. That's, this is old knowledge. And, this when is that, old and that wisdom. is from an ancient yeah, Chinese absolutely. recipe. Yes. Uh, yeah. So how much of your job and, and uh, the of your butchery, the Provador, is about having those conversations and perhaps even a, a re-education? Almost all of it. Yeah. Actually, that's it. I mean, well, I suppose there's... Well, I mean, it goes back to why we wrote the book. It's like it's that's the same. That's it. Yeah. So, um, and in our practice, I suppose there's two parts of it. One is, and we do talk about this in the book as well, mm. one is the, um, I suppose, the respect for the skill and craft of butchery because um, increasingly, this is a... a one way of answering your question. There's sort of two aspects. One is 
educating ourselves and our customers um, about how to eat the whole animal. Um, and that these are conversations we have all day, every day in our butchery. Um, and we send out a newsletter and we talk about that endlessly as well. But there's also this idea of celebrating the craft of butchery because increasingly, um, and Grant can speak to this more closely than I can, but increasingly um, what happens is that butchers will receive boxes of sections of an animal and they're indeterminate because they're buying from a wholesaler and animals from all sorts of different farms will go into a, into a job lot and then they get purchased and they get broken down by the abattoir and then they're put in boxes and they're sent out to butchers who buy mm. them from wholesalers. So the butcher doesn't necessarily know where the animal comes from, doesn't have a connection with the farmer and, um, and the butcher's knowledge is being compromised and whittled away because they're never cutting a whole animal and they're never experiencing the whole the, the exercise of breaking down a whole animal and seeing it mm. as a direct sort of relationship and expression of the farm from which it came. And so in our butchery, we are whole body butchers. So our butchers are highly skilled craftspeople, you know, and what they do is quite beautiful and quite wonderful. And we believe it should be celebrated because we're losing that skill. Across the world, across the Western world, we're losing these skills. They're important skills to keep and we should respect the people who do this work for us. You describe it in the book as a dying art. Yeah, it's a bad pun, sorry. <laughs> but well, um, It's done at yeah. an abattoir level now. So yeah, it's, that's it. Animals mm. are, are boned in the abattoir and often hot boned, which means they're not even cold before they bone them and then, and then straight into plastic and then straight into a box. So it's containerized instantly, which, mm. you know, I get it in terms of logistics, yeah. Anything that goes into a box on a pallet can be handled a lot more easily than than a truck that backs up to the front of our place and a guy wearing a sort of a funny hat that, with little flaps on it that protects his sort of neck and shoulders, you know, puts an enormous um, you know forequarter of beef on the on on his shoulder and carries it off the truck and hangs it in our in our cool room. I mean. Mm. Inefficient, yes, I guess it is in terms of moving sheer quantities of protein. But, you know, it's a, it's a cost of that and we just see it as a necessary sort of part of the way we work. And, and I think it's really, you know, it's important that people, we, we like to take people into the call room and we have a big window in our shop which looks straight into the, into the call room. So, you know, you're always reminded the, this the, is where the it comes of from. What you do. Um, Perhaps that transparency and, piece you were touching yeah. on earlier. And if you want that cut, I'm sorry we've sold all that this week, I can't do that for you. Um, but have you considered this cut instead you know and uh you know the 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 statistic i think laura was referring to was the eye fillet you know which is a fairly standard cut on on any on any animal but in beef it it's it's about 1.3 percent of the total body weight so if you see a 300 kilo carcass there we're getting about four kilos of eye fillet from that carcass 300 kilos that's about how often you should eat it. But I think most people would, would feel that they could eat it more often than that. And if you do want to eat it more often than that, then you're entering into a commodity market where weight is the only thing that's really given value. So Yeah, that, the whole question of value is another. another. Mm. I mean, that's another big topic, obviously. You may, you may have other questions, but yeah, yeah. the question so of value is... Let's, go well, no, that allows <laughs> well, let's, talk, let's talk about the value conflict yeah. because you're, in the book you touch on the faster, bigger, cheaper, the... Mm. I guess the the mass production piece. So, where does value fit in that matrix, or does it at all? Well, that's the problem. It would say to you that the commodity market says that you know the market looks after value, but in fact, it's actually a really highly distorted market because mm. if you know, take beef for an example, we buy uh, pretty much exclusively two to four year old cattle. Now, that's much older than than is sold in in you know by most butchers. Most butchers are selling essentially yearling cattle that might be somewhere between 15 months and say 20 months old. Uh, there's no doubt that if they go through another winter that their flavour is much deeper, their, their meat is much better in terms of pure quality, but, the, but they will get less money for that animal if they went to the market and sold it because it's too big. Nobody really wants to deal with it. What they want is a 180 to 200 kilogram carcass that fits on the rail that can be broken down really simply. So all of these things are to do, not to do with the quality of the animal, the, the life of the animal, the life of the soil. They're to do with, does it work in our production room? Mm. It's sort of like the apple varieties. What, yeah. what stores well, that's the apple we're going to grow. Not flavour, not sort of any other qualities that it might have. 
those qualities are actually really vital and, and it's that diversity and we haven't touched on that really yet. We're trying to create <laughs> diversity. If only the book wasn't so big. <laughs> so much to talk about. Well, we've talked about it in sort of broad terms. Yeah. We haven't specified yeah. that it's actually the diversity that we're really, really interested in. Seeing as many different plants in that field mm. uh, as possible. So, you know, grass fed isn't just kaikuya. It's a, a huge range of different plants, which the animals will select from, you know, given the chance and, and medicate themselves from. So one of the common uh, things that, that sort of often goes unremarked and we have to sort of remind ourselves is that the farmers that we work with virtually have no veterinary bills. And if you look at a, 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 like a large dairy, a vet mm. ma basically lives on site. Um, those animals are point, pushed to the point of su high levels of production that they're, they're not particularly healthy. And if you're going to ingest something, just as that animal ingested a range of grasses and made meat out of it, you're, it's about to make, you're, you're about to make meat out of it in your body as well. And you want to make sure that that's the highest quality protein and, and the best quality a, you know, animal that you could possibly eat. And rather than eating something that's highly compromised, um, and this is where health issues start to come in because mm. you know, we have an imbalanced diet and we're eating animals and plants that have reduced nutritional density and that's a direct result of the soil's impoverishment. Increasingly, so for example, if you imagine, you know, we know now because, because science has told us over the last few years how important gut health is mm. and the gut, you know, biome is. Um, if you imagine that when we are less healthy when we have a compromised um, and, um, and simplified gut microbiome mm. um, the same goes for animals yeah. and if if you have a sort of a um, a sequence a cascade of narrowing all the way through from the breeds of the varieties of animals and their diets are simplified and narrowed as well and their gut mi microbiome is compromised by that you know it's like the whole thing is narrowing down all the way through we ingest that and that has an impact on us and what we now understand is that is that when we eat animals that have come out of systems where there's a lot of complexity and a lot of diversity and they have healthy gut uh, microbiomes we absorb that and that increases um, and improves ours as well which has a profound influence on our entire physical mm. well-being so you know it's no it comes back to the interconnectedness again yeah. it's no mist it's no it's no mystery really why these things have an impact on each other um, and but the value thing is really important, and we acknowledge that that's an issue. You know, mm. uh, look, there there is plenty of other areas that I could go, <laughs> delve into, but but I am conscious that of course we're not going to have any time for questions. Yeah, uh, and I wondered if there were, if there was someone that wanted to ask a first question to kick us off. I just remember to stand up and wait for the microphone, or just get you at the front here, and just make sure you mention your name at the start as well. Hi, I'm, I'm Liz. Um, thank you so much for such a stimulating and interesting conversation. I'm wondering if you could um, give us some thoughts on the ethics of cow's milk production. Mm. Mm. And I also want to ask, where can I find my local, how can I find my local ethical butchery? <laughs> okay, well, yeah, milk is, milk production is, is very fraught. Um, we have one uh, buffalo producer that we work with specifically who uh, keeps her calves on on the cows for until they're ready to be weaned at about eight to ten months and that's usually generated by the cow rather than the calf um, so they share the milk um, they separate them uh, at night do a morning milking and then put the calves back together again uh, with the mothers so of course that's not how most milk production goes um, they're separated at three days, just they get colostrum and then they're taken off. And those, those especially those boy cows. Um, that's a waste product. Yeah, they're viewed as, as a waste know. product, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, and there used to be a market for that, uh, but now they can't even, the costs of driving the truck to pick them up are too expensive. So mostly they're killed on the farm and just put in a hole. Um, the cost of the abattoir and the and the, the transport is more than the, the the value of the animal. I mean, uh, clearly that's 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 a sort of an issue. So one of the, it's also male laying chickens as well, or from male chickens mm. from laying species, because mm. the other one would be a bit strange. Um, <laughs> there's one grower that we're working with now who who buys those one day old 
um, male chicks from the from the laying um, sort of rare breed laying places, and then grows them out, and we buy them as cockerels at 16 weeks. So there are sort of ways of doing it. Um, Mainstream it means less milk volume, production, though, though is, yeah, is, it's is, really tricky. is really fraught. Yeah. So it probably should yeah, be. I mean, fraught. there's a classic case of, of value not corresponding with cost. Mm. I mean, dollar a, li- dollar a litre milk is cheaper than water. Is is cheaper than water. It's as dodgy as a four dollar t shirt. I mean, we know secretly. You know, when you buy that t shirt, there's a certain guilt associated with that. I think because you know that it must have cost more than that or if it's only costing four dollars who got it in the neck to provide Mm. it to us Mm. at four dollars and it's no different to milk the animal gets it in the neck the environment that that animal lives in is compromised and the person who Mm. looks after those animals nobody wins out of that system Mm. except it would seem the retailers and it's they can afford to run certain items at a loss anyway where because they get you, you know, in the cleaning products section, so where the markups uh, by, are very by high. By extension of that, how, how much would a litre of milk be if it was done under the principles by which we've been discussing? Probably seven or eight dollars. Uh, per litre? Hmm. Maybe six or seven. I can't, I, yeah, I don't I, I, have I, a lot to do with dairy, but, with that. Yeah, but you could expect it to be dramatically more. They know that one dollar a litre, I mean, even farmers are saying that's below the cost of production. Mm. So. You know, if, if they were even that system, which is a fairly exploitative system, might be bringing it in at three dollars a litre. So it wouldn't be hard to imagine it might be twice as much if and you the consequence, ran a different thing. the consequence of that too is that it squeezes small operators out of the market, yeah. which is what's happened in lots of industries, of course, and many of the aspects of food. And so then you end up with which with. Um, you know, sort of conglomerates, you end up with larger organisations that have more... And do things on mass. That's it, that's yeah. right. And so then you end up, you know, that, and that's complex too because that's a narrowing of diversity again. Mm. As far as the question about ethical butchers, mm. um, I don't know um, I don't know the landscape here, but um, certainly in the book we provide a list of questions that we recommend people ask um, anybody they're buying. Gone. Yeah, <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, we all, all of us, we're all consumers. I mean, whether it's meat or you know or 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 food or clothes or whatever it is we all owe it to ourselves and to our children and the future really to take it on ourselves to demand transparency to demand accountability you know to be prepared to walk away if we're not happy with the answers if you can't understand what it says on the label don't buy it you know like it's Mm. michael pollan said eat food mostly plants um and only things that your grandmother would recognise, which is a nice maxim, <laughs> mm. I think. Mm. Uh, just another question down the front here. My name's Jessica, and um, I'm an avid gardener, so I work on the principles of um, worm farms and compost. And mm. It's taken me 20 years to get the soil in my garden to be absorbent, mm. and I'm still working on it. I'm still working on it. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know um, what your views are on um, hormones in meat production. What, you know, why do they do that? Uh, comes back to growth rates. So it's the commodity market's only rewarding weight. Uh, it rewards no other, other uh, sort of idea of value. And so that's where we sort of we're about to say but I, I thank you for asking that question because it finishes the answer <laughs> and that is that when if you narrow down the, the list of parameters of value to simply weight mm. you will get those sorts of responses because farmers are rewarded for giving growth hormone to cattle because they do put on weight faster now there's a whole range of other things that happen but they're not taken into consideration in terms of in terms of the value of the animal that farmer will get paid on the weight of that carcass and so, you know, the incentive, the incentive it would seem then is to grow those animals as quickly as possible. Um, in Tasmania, they're illegal. In every other state in Australia, they are legal. They are, the, uh, when the farmer sends that cattle to market, it actually has a declaration on it, which mm-hmm. says whether it's been administered growth hormones. So. Every animal you, that you buy should be able to be identified whether it's had hormones. There's a withholding Every period butcher, though, isn't there? Pardon? There's a withholding period. Uh, there is, but yeah. I mean, it, yeah. it, they're obliged to say it on, on, yeah. the, on the declaration before they send that cattle to slaughter or to the market. 
Uh, so in fact, every butcher should be able to tell you whether it's been administered hormones or not, which sort of goes back to the set of questions that you ask your butcher, where did you get this? Um, yeah, mm. and look, you know, it, it's what every butcher did in the past. This is, we're not sort of, re, you know, you're, it's, it, we're doing old stuff. Mm. Um, really just trying to, to, to sort of re-establish networks that were always the way, you know, the, the abattoirs were, were co-ops owned by butcher shops, you know, so that's how, and you sent your cattle in, you got a free kill in exchange for the offal and the hide, and they, they went back to the farmer, you know, so these are, these are very sort of old fashioned things, but unfortunately with the abattoirs uh, closing and uh, a concentration of abattoirs and being further apart, that that part of the business is, is more and more difficult. Whether we, sh we shouldn't use, I mean, our, our sort of position is that we don't buy cattle that have had, had uh, growth hormones. By extension of Jessica's question, what are the nutrition implications or the health implications on us of those types of hormones? I don't think they've done the research really, you know, over a long though. enough time. What, what they are doing the research now about is actually nutritional density in, in different foodstuffs. So, um, at the moment, they're all seen as exactly the same, you know, and the nutritional uh, information panels that you'll see are just averages that you generate. You, f you, you just put in the weight uh, online and it spits out, this is how much uh, nutrient it's got in it. I mean, it's... Divorced it's from how it's Completely been divorced grown from reality, but they're not really interested in that. So. We need to change, you know, it's a... It's a um, um, we were talking about this at a, in a conversation last night. We need to completely change. It's a paradigm shift that's required here. We need mm. to change the way we see things and the way we can, the way we understand health and the way we see the world. It's we need to spin ourselves around and understand that, mm. you know, um, that what we've been doing is not working for us. We have an, you know, a, um, an epidemic of of nutrition food, food related, related illness, yeah. illness and you know it's unsustainable it's we we really um, and it costs us as a community as a society an absolute fortune you know yeah i mean adult so onset diabetes is now being renamed because so many children have it you know it's type 2 and that's a food related illness largely so it tells you something you know and um it's all doom and gloom, isn't it? Look, there are some great stories as well, I swear. What there are some people like doing some say. incredible things. Yes, and... and, and <laughs> but I guess that's what we're talking about, isn't it? We're talking about the other side of, yeah. of that, of, of, you know, highlighting what the danger, the risk is. Yeah. And, the, and this is the alternative, and, which is why I love that list of questions you can ask, because it actually empowers each of us. And, and you've, you keep touching on this thing that we, even though we're an individual, we still are part of a market economy and we can... Every dollar, matter. yeah, like we, you know, the reason that Coles doesn't serve, um, doesn't sell sow stall pork anymore, isn't because they give a toss about sow stalls, you know, and and pigs welfare. It's because consumers voted with their pockets. This we can change this, and it's not happening at a regulatory level. It's not mm. happening at a legislative People. level. We have to do this, yeah, yeah and w mm. we can, you know. So that drive has produced change there's no doubt about it mm. the, the the definition around eggs as we were talking about mm. sow stall free which is still a bit uh a bit woolly but well it's woolly because what it tells you is that the sow wasn't confined leading up to giving birth mm. it doesn't tell you that she then spends um uh three or four weeks in a farrowing crate which is which is a divided uh, cage that she can't turn around in. They've still got those, but because it says sow stall free, you start to feel, well, that's much better. So, so if you, it, they, they've worked out how to buy you off. Your legitimate concerns um, are assuaged very easily if you think that that's sow stall free. They're not going to show you a picture of a, of a, of a, a, a nursing uh, female pig lying down where the piglets can only uh, access access her teats and nothing else, and she can't turn around. And that to us is an inhuman and inhumane way to treat a, an animal, any animal, but one especially as, as intelligent as a pig. They will say to you that, oh, that she'll, scrap, she'll squash some of her young if we don't do that. And yes, there are occasionally uh, deaths of young ones. They do have up to 14 piglets in a, in a, in a litter, which is part of the reason they have so many. Um, but generally, if they have room, they squash very few. And um, you know, it, it's also what's the cost of that? If the cost is that a, that a, a female pig is restrained for 
for three weeks at a time, that would seem excessive to us. We've, we've had um, conversations, for example, with the NRMA um, over the years because RSPCA? the NRMA... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but the car to get to the really RSPCA organisations, I tell you what. <laughs> Oh, you really um, are expanding the conversation. Yeah, we're so this is about diversity, that's what I said, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the RSPCA, because as you know, the RSPCA endorse, um, you know, certain um, uh, standards. Uh, standards. That's right. There's the RSPCA standard. It's, from our perspective, that standard is way too low. The RSPCA argues that what you're trying to do is lift things up from the bottom and you have to encourage the big operators. If you set the bar too high, they won't improve and they won't be encouraged to improve Small their standards. Small incremental changes. And, yeah. you know, it's a really interesting debate and I'm not sure, you know, we, we sit at one end of the debate. You need, you need a whole lot of people around the table having these conversations. You need to bring everybody together to have the conversation. But, um, you know, the point is... And this is what we also try and say in the book. I think it's important to make this point that um, we have strong opinions and we, we occupy a really particular place and we don't resolve from that. But, you know, we're unapologetic about it. But we are also non-judgmental because every single step in the right direction that anybody makes at any point, whether it's, you know, a large corporation or an individual, mm. should be celebrated and encouraged. And, you know, because that's how we move forward. It's, that's the critical thing. So it's very easy to, I don't know, I find myself sometimes lying in bed thinking I can't even put my foot over the edge of the bed because, you know, I'm going to put on a thong that was made by out of some incredibly compromised system and the floor was polished with some toxic chemical and, you know, it's like it's all too much. But actually... She doesn't sleep well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like but, a, but the it's a lot of weight. It's yeah. a lot of weight. We, we all carry yeah. a lot of weight. We're all worried and concerned about these things. But, you know, um, you know, encourage yourself, congratulate yourself when you do make one step in the mm. right direction. That's how we make change. Yeah, and I think that that's a, a perfect place uh, <laughs> for us to round out this conversation that could have gone mm. on and on. Uh, thank you both so much for, for joining pleasure. us today. Thank Ladies you. and gentlemen, Thanks please so much, give it up. Dan. Laura thank you. And Grant thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dan Borsha and this is Let's Talk. Thanks very much for your company as part of Floriad Reimagined 2020. Check out Floriad Australia online for plenty more details about how you can get involved in these conversations and more. Yara, thanks for your time.